Welcome to the Goldmark Gallery and to our latest exhibition of sculptures by the sculptor Frank Dobson. This is both an exhibition that shows the breadth of what Dobson achieved as an artist. We have bronze uh, casts here, we have some beautiful drawings on the walls. It's also the launch of our latest book, and that is Frank Dobson, Bring It Alive by Andrew Lamberth. Andrew Lamberth, art writer, uh, critic, historian, who's been kind enough to really capture the essence of what Dobson's work was all about in this, our latest book. The title comes from something that Frank Dobson would often say to his students when he was teaching at the Royal College of Art, something he did in the latter years of his life. He used to say, scintillate the surface, bring it alive. And that's what we've tried to do in this exhibition, both in the way that we've shown the work, with works on revolving plinths, uh, the breadth of what we've shown here, but also um, in what we've done with some of the bronzes that you'll see on display in this show, many of which were from uh, terracottas or plaster models that had never been editioned in Dobson's lifetime. So this is in many ways a show that brings to life what Frank Dobson achieved in his work. Frank Dobson was one of the great sculptors of 20th century in Britain. He is sort of a missing link between two generations. He was younger than Jacob Epstein, but older than Henry Moore. As a result, his career has sort of often fallen through the cracks. It was interrupted at both ends by two world wars. First, as a young man sent to the front during the First World War, and then later in the Second World War, which interrupted his creative period. His career sort of falls between those two major events, and his best-known work was produced during that period. It sort of captures some of the art deco elegance of that period of time. He made many fabric designs that were sort of very much of that period. It's a period that was marked by a kind of union of great craftsmanship and luxury and elegance, on the other hand. And that's really what we see in the best of Dobson's work. Many of the, the long, elongated lines of Art Deco, those clean, crisp lines, that sense of forward movement of progress and optimism, is captured in some of his work. Something like this kneeling torso that has all that feeling of a, a luxury cruise liner, its prow cutting through the ice. It's got this beautiful dynamic pose to it. It's exactly the kind of exploration of the female form for which he was to become very well known. In fact, the best known and probably most celebrated of Dobson's work was to become a kind of icon of Art Deco itself. And it's this beautiful portrait of the writer Osbert Sitwell. Dobson's studio in Chelsea put him right in the midst of a, of a sort of milieu of important writers, artists. Just down the road, close neighbours were Ben Nicholson, Sitwell himself, and also the writer and adventurer T.E. Lawrence. In fact, it's Lawrence's cast of this portrait of Sitwell, which now resides in the Tate. He thought it was probably Frank Dobson's finest piece of portraiture, something that captured not just the sort of elegance of the sitter, but also of that period of time. Something that is also as loud as the massed band of the guards. It has all the hallmarks of Art Deco about it, this beautiful polished surface, these clean, luxuriant lines. But there's also here evidence of the knowledge that Frank Dobson had of the art world, um, of the art that was going on around him and on the continent. Something like the sculptural work of Brancusi, whom he knew and admired. The grandeur and the elongation that you see embodied in Art Deco style, but which you also find in Gothic sculpture from many centuries past, you'll also find in Frank Dobson's work. He was not afraid to pick and choose from uh, various stylistic sources of inspiration. He was also not afraid to play with the dimensions of the human body, to balloon, to broaden, to essentialize, so that the figure of the models in front of him uh, works like these female figures around us seem almost to take on kind of primordial proportions. Though you recognise recurring faces in some of these works, the women in Frank Dobson's art are 
essentially archetypes. They're sort of classical embodiments of the symbols, the virtues, the things that Greeks would talk about in their own goddesses. They're symbols of fertility, of fecundity, a kind of earthly generosity. They're symbols of sex, yes, but also of companionship and sisterly, motherly love. The great power of Frank Dobson's art was that he could take something specific to him, a specific relationship, as, for example, in a work like this, produced not long after he met his second wife, Mary, and transform it, transform his model, transform that experience into something that feels universal. As Andrew Lamberth makes clear in his book, the roundness, the kind of rotundity to these forms, they're often related to Maiol, who really did take inspiration from classical sculpture, from the Greeks and the Romans. But for Dobson, as for so many of his generation, it was the world sculpture of the British museums. It was the sculpture of Egypt, of uh, Nigeria, of Polynesia, of pre-Columbian America that really informed his sense of form. If anything, Frank Dobson's work is a kind of sculptural equivalent of the female figures we find in Picasso and Gauguin. They take on a, a kind of earthier, more archaic feeling. While their hairstyles often single them out as women of a particular period in time, that interwar period, it's the pictures, the scrolls, the tablets, the founts that they're found with that gives them this sense of ancient, archaic feeling. A versatile and sociable sculptor, he was a practical, hands-on man. Frank Dobson came alive in the practical realm of his workshop, the kind of fraternity of apprentices, of uh, studio assistants, of foundries, dealers, patrons and collectors. He was a skilled portraitist, and whether his sitter was a dancer, an actor, a ballerina, a writer, an entrepreneur or a, an elder statesman, or even an anonymous model, he could find a kind of lyricism in the person in front of him. He could transform that close, intimate experience of sitting with a model into something that has all of the elegance, the grandeur of his best portrait work. I particularly like this example. It's simply titled Rhoda, and it has this wonderful, melancholic feel to this elongated form this beautiful gaze that just looks out beyond us, and of course this scintillated surface that's brought her alive. To put it simply, Frank Dobson enjoyed company, and when the threat of the Second World War of the Blitz sent him away from his London studio, he found it difficult. He and his family decamped from Chelsea to Bristol, where he spent his time uh, moving around the uh, factories, around uh, steelworks and munition works, around the docklands, around tube stations, searching, feeling in the curves of industry, of steel works, of, of vast pieces of machinery, the kind of curves that he'd felt out and looked for in the female figure. As Incendiary bombs then landed on Bristol. He was sent even further afield to a, a tiny cottage in Hampshire. And yearning for form, he looked out and found it in the huge, vast trunks of trees, the limb-like branches, where he found a kind of corresponding sense of form as he did in his figures and his models. On his return to London, he found that his intuition to move away was right. His studio on Manresa Road had been bombed and much of the work within it destroyed. It was one of many critical misfortunes he suffered throughout his career. There is a kind of general optimism, a faith in humanity that you find represented in Frank Dobson's work, but occasionally he could draw on and dwell on that uh, kind of insecurity, that period of fear and discomfort that he must have experienced as a young man on the front in the First World War. This is one of the most exciting uh, finds in this exhibition. It's a sculpture called The Nest. It's something that was found, we didn't know, it's not been catalogued in the catalogue resume of Dobson's sculptures. But its provenance is confirmed by a sketch in the VNA of exactly this scene. It shows this wonderful 
stylized bird with its chicks beneath it and it's feeding them. It reminds me almost of that kind of sacrificial symbol of the pelican plucking its breast to feed its children. But it's also, as you can see, it's got the sharp lines, the kind of menacing shapes that a lot of vorticist work has, uh, particularly the animal sculptures of Omrigo di Objeska. It has this feeling of something that may have come from wartime experience, and it's been tentatively dated to somewhere in the 1920s and 1930s. It's been cast in bronze for the very first time by the Goldmark Gallery, and it's here on this show that you can see it for the first time on display. But ultimately, the enduring subject of Frank Dobson's art, of his career, was the female figure. He preferred to work it in clay with tools rather than fingers and thumbs, spreading, rolling and plying the clay surface with knives and spatulas. He could move at ease from straightforward observation of models in front of him, drawn in sanguine chalk, to an idea, the idea represented in the female figure. And he also loved the formal challenge of trying to follow the curves, the musculature, the tensions, the uh, internal rhythms and shapes of the female figure, particularly when paired with another. He might begin with a smaller maquette and then move to life drawing with models in front of him. And it was only then that he would uh, translate these experiences into something universal, uh, a sculpture that seemed to embody the ideas that he found in the female figure, in which he saw represented every part of every, every facet of human experience. Although almost exclusively drawn and depicted in the nude, Frank Dobson's essentialized female figures range dramatically from the platonic to the overtly sensual and erotic. Many examples of these, and more subdued ones, were destroyed eventually after Frank Dobson's death in 1963 by his wife, Mary. A young art critic, Brian Sewell, was enlisted to help clear the studio and he watched in horror as she burnt and tore drawings not unlike these and took the hammer and smashed terracottas. Whatever was lost in that frenzy is countered by the great wealth that you see on display here in this exhibition, and in particular the bronzes that were never cast during Dobson's lifetime. Represented in the drawings and in the models themselves is the kind of generosity that Frank Dobson saw expressed in the female figure and which is imbued in all his work. Those virtues of self-sacrifice, those ideas of leisure, of warmth, emotional warmth, compassion, are all imbued in his work. And it's what we have here to enjoy in this exhibition. This is one of few opportunities to see Dobson's work uh, up close and in the flesh, uh, brought alive in this exhibition. So do please come and visit us if you can. We look forward to seeing some of you here soon.